So how many of you guys are from up north? Pretty well, north, okay. You remember driving in the snow? Do you miss it? No. Okay, so I lived in Virginia for one year. Actually, it was like 10 months out of my life. All right, and it was my first experience driving in the snow. So I lived in the country in a rural neighborhood on a mountain. So going to work, going to school, going anywhere. I had to go down all these mountain roads. And then, you know, in the winter, of course, the first snow comes in. At first I was excited, right? Because I'm from Florida. So it's like, we're playing in the snow, it's great. Uh, then you had to drive to work. It's not so great anymore. So I remember that when I first began driving, you know, my hands were at 10 to 2, the mirrors correct, I was very scared, I was praying, I was wondering if I needed to buy chains for my tires, I mean, all of this stuff. And I'm driving so slowly, so carefully, you know, I had my hazards on just to make sure I wasn't going to, you know, go off this mountain. That was day one. Then day two passed, and day three, and before you know it, you know, I started to get a little confident in my driving abilities. Started to think, well, you know, this ain't so bad. I don't know why these people are always complaining about all these, these Yankees <laughs> complaining about snow. Um, just relaxed. I began to think it was a challenge, you know, how fast could I get to work? And uh, I'd see these people in the ditches by the wayside and think, what fools, you know? <laughs> anyway, one day I turned a corner a little too sharp and the back of my truck began to slide over and I began to panic a little bit, but then I recovered. And I remember the thought crossed into my mind, I got this, I got this driving in the snow. And I remember as soon as those thoughts passed from my mind, I turned another corner and I just remember I just kept turning and kept going and off the road I went and then down this hill I went and I smashed into a tree. My airbags exploded, the whole front of my truck just like dissolved like a soda can and I remember I got out of the truck sore and I raised my fists and I said I'm moving back to Florida. So, and that is exactly what I did. So you ever been in a situation like that though? Where you're nearby something dangerous? And then you get familiar with it, you stop to be worried about it so much, and before long, you don't even think about it, and then it gets you, and you wreck. So today, I'm going to warn you about something that can wreck us, uh, something dangerous that threatens our life, just as Christians, but everybody. Now, you know what the sign language uh, symbol for a preacher is? Anybody know? this. <laughs> I don't know who thought of that, but he didn't like preachers very much. I'm not here to do this. I am here to warn you. I'm here to warn you. So, we've been going through Romans. This is what we've learned so far in the book of Romans. We learned that the gospel has revealed God's righteousness to us. And this righteousness is one that is shared with us and given to us on the basis of faith. It's made possible because Jesus Christ was the righteous one, and he died on the cross in our place, and is willing to take our sins and then give his righteousness to us. So when we accept Jesus Christ in faith, we are united with him. We receive his righteousness, and he takes our sins, and we are justified. Declared to be righteous in the sight of God, we are forgiven and saved from the penalty of our sins. Today, if you've trusted Christ, not only are you forgiven, and save from the penalty of your sins, you have peace with God. And Romans 5 says, we now stand in the grace of God. We stand in grace. <clears throat> and we rejoice in the hope of sharing in the glory of God. It's an amazing thing, this salvation. Now, as we live this new life, risen with Christ, walking with Christ, forgiven, saved, no Sin can now separate us from God. There remains no condemnation for us, no judgment. There is no threat of hell. That power has been broken. When you are saved, you are saved, you are saved. You stand in grace, and glory is promised you. Sin will not separate you from God. But sin still threatens us. It's a clear and present danger still for the Christian. So this morning, let us read Romans chapter 6. I'm going to begin in verse 12. Listen to this passage, the word of God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, 
and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, this says in verse 12, do not let sin reign. Okay? Do not let sin reign. Do not let sin reign. Do not let sin reign. Sin wants to reign over you this morning. Don't let it. A very simple verse. Don't let sin reign. What does it look like when sin reigns? It says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. When sin reigns, it makes you obey. That's what the reign of sin looks like. It makes you obey its lusts. Now, we use lust always in like a sexual term today. But lust simply means desire. Sin makes you obey what it wants. What you want. That's what James says. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So each one of us, we're all tempted. You know, Christ himself was tempted. In every way like as we are, it says. But he never gave in to temptation. He never sinned. We are all tempted in different ways by different things. You may not be tempted by what I'm tempted with, and I may not be tempted with what you're tempted with. But we are all tempted. This desire, we're enticed, we're drawn in. When we give in, that's a sin. Sin is always drawing us in. The old Adam in us, our sinful nature, is always being drawn to things it shouldn't be. Any of you guys ever seen Lord of the Rings? Yes? Read it? If you haven't, I don't know what you're doing with your life. You should read it. <laughs> when Gandalf gives Frodo the ring, Frodo's going to begin his trek to destroy it forever. Gandalf says, always remember Frodo. The ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. And whatever you do, don't put it on. In much the same way, our bodies are drawn to sin. And it always wants to get back to its former master. It wants to be found. Do not let it reign. How do we let sin reign? It says in verse 13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So we let sin reign by presenting ourselves to sin. Paul kind of, if you imagine this throne room, sin sits on the throne. We walk into this throne room, we kneel down, and we present ourselves to sin. That's what it's looking like. And when we do that, sin begins to reign over us. We are letting it reign. And as sin reigns, it begins to command us. And we must obey. You know what that's called? It's called slavery. Slavery. Look at verse 16 of Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So when we present ourselves to sin, we are willingly letting sin reign, and we are becoming slaves to sin. And when you are a slave to sin, you have no choice but to obey. Now don't sit there and say, I'm a Christian, because Christians can be slaves to sin again. We have been freed from it, but don't we know Christians who are slaves to sin? 
Have you ever been enslaved to a sin? Are you enslaved to a sin as a Christian? It can happen. Paul is warning us not to let it happen. Now, how do we present ourselves to sin? What does that mean? So let's break sin down into like three types, okay? There's like three basic types of sin. This isn't an official thing. This is just to help us understand, okay? Every preacher has everything worked out in his head. But first, there's ignorant sins, okay? So sometimes you do things, you have habits, you have cycles or patterns in your life. Uh, you may hang on to something that you shouldn't, and you don't even realize it. And it's wrong. Well, you don't realize it's wrong. Or maybe you just get saved, you're learning more about Jesus, and you have all these old things you used to do, and you don't even really know what's right or wrong just yet. And then as you're growing, and as you're maybe reading God's Word, or listening to a sermon about the Word, or talking to a godly friend, the Holy Spirit hits you with something, and says, you know what, that thing you're doing is, is wrong. It's an ignorant sin. You know, Ken and I went through a book a few months ago, and it was a little devotional book, and we had a chapter on bitterness. And we were talking about bitterness. Now, if you would ask me if I was a bitter person, I'd say, no, I ain't bitter about anything. Well, then, as we went through that chapter, I realized I was bitter towards a few people. The Holy Spirit hit me. You got bitterness. I was like, ooh, I didn't realize that. I was in ignorance. Now that I realize it, i got to make it right. i got to abandon it, or else that ignorance sin will turn into something else, which is what we're going to get to. So let me just tell you something right now. we probably all got those blind spots in our life. So drop your pride and your self-righteousness. Because you may not think you have any issues, but we all got blind spots. I was a bitter guy. I had no idea. Lord willing, hopefully, today I'm not. I took care of it. But I probably still got some things in my life. Maybe you see them and I don't. Maybe I see yours and you don't. But we're still ignorant of some things. But you got ignorant sins. We got to take care of them. But sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So that's not presenting yourself to sin. Now, number two, we have momentary sins, right? So like, Last night, I had the option, right? I, I stubbed my toe. I stubbed three toes. I thought they were just going to, like, rip right off my foot. Now, I didn't. I don't think I sinned in that, but have you ever been there? Where you, you drop something on your toe, and you, uh, and you say a bunch of things that you never thought you'd ever say in your life, but you said them. Momentary sins. Or, you know, you have bad news, or something happens at work, you weren't expecting it, and you react just just wrong way. That's a momentary sin. All right? we, we, we're all in danger of falling into those types of sins. Now, if you're falling into the same momentary sins again and again, those aren't momentary sins. Those are patterns and cycles, and those, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay? Um, if you lose your temper today and go, oh, that was a momentary thing, but then you lose it again tomorrow, that's not a momentary sin. That's a, that's a problem you have. But we all get these, we're all in danger. You know? First Corinthians says, you know, everyone who thinks they're standing, watch out that you don't fall. So we could fall. That happens, right? You know, Jesus told Peter, Peter, you know, Satan wants to come up and sift you like wheat. Peter's like, no way, not me. Then he denied Christ just like that. It happened. He didn't live a life of denial, but he denied in the moment. So those things happen. But that's not what we're talking about today. Third type of sin is willful sin. Willful sin. All right? That's what we're talking about here. Willful sins are sins we choose to do. And we choose to keep doing them after we know they're wrong. Now, I'm sure you already have some ideas in your head about what these can be, you know, and there's plenty of them, you know. Maybe you're someone who just always blows up at every time you don't get your way. Every single time something doesn't go right, you blow up in anger. You're choosing to do that, and you keep doing it. Anger. Some of you guys, uh, not, maybe not some of you, right, but there are people out there that are just gossips, right? When they, when they call, you know. You know, you're going to gossip. And then you become a gossip because you, oh, you can't wait till they call. You want to hear what they have. These are, these are willful sins, right? Bitterness can become a willful sin. Lack of forgiveness, you know? There's all kinds out, all kinds of sins out there. You, know, you can be sleeping around. You can be addicted to pornography. And you know what's wrong. And you get so mad. And you, get, you feel so much shame afterwards. But then you just turn around and you just do it again. Willful. Willful. When we are doing willful sins, what we are doing is presenting ourselves to sin. And saying, give me what I want. Reign over me. And it does. And we become enslaved to it. It is literally walking into that throne room and presenting ourselves to it. And what was once a choice to sin, all of a sudden becomes something we don't really choose to do anymore. We just do it. And then we begin to hate it. But we still do it. And we become enslaved to this thing, like an addict. It happened to a Christian. And once sin begins to reign, okay, have you ever seen a government rule over one area and not one another? No. As soon as sin reigns over one area, it breeds slavery in another. 
Look what it says in verse 19. It says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. You see that? So when we present ourselves to sin, lawlessness results in more lawlessness. So sin breeds sin. Slavery in one area spreads to slavery in another. Because sin doesn't just want one little part of you, it wants all of you. And it grows. And what does it result in? Well, verse 16 says, sin resulting in death. In verse 21, it says, What benefit were you then deriving from the thing of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. Sin brings shame and sin brings death. Now, it doesn't bring spiritual death for the Christian because we are alive to God. We are connected to God. It can't separate us from Him. But there are a lot of other ways to die, okay? I mean, we still... I know Christians who have been physically killed by their sins. It happens. I mean, we have these big examples in our minds, right? We think of someone who becomes addicted to drugs as a Christian, and they can still overdose and die, and their sin killed them. There are people who become alcoholics, and they can't handle it, and then they die one night while they're drunk. Like, that sin killed them. But it happens in other ways, too. I mean, you, a few months ago, there was a shooting in Atlanta. You remember that? The man went around to all of these massage parlors and began shooting people and shooting people. And then he ends up killing himself. And everyone, and it happens to be these Asian massage parlors. So everyone thought it was anti-Asian hate. And then when it spoke to his friends, it said, no, actually, he had nothing against any particular race. What happened was he was a very religious guy. And he was going to them for sexual favors. Then he became addicted to it. And he got so frustrated, he killed them and killed himself. So you know what happened in those moments? He became a slave to his sin. And eventually that sin killed him. Now, those are extreme examples, I know. But like I said, there's a lot of ways to die. There are Christians out there walking around with their joy is killed, their peace is killed, their marriage is killed, their friendships are killed, their families are killed, their walk with the Lord is killed, their heart is cold and hard. I mean, there are a lot of ways to die. Sin kills. The best illustration for this is an old book by Robert Louis Stevenson named Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anyone ever read that? Okay, you know the story? Dr. Jekyll, he was this guy, he, he always felt the draw to sin, but he didn't want to sin. He wanted to focus on his studies. And so finally he came up with this great concoction, a serum that he could drink. And when Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll when he drank this serum, he transformed into Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde could do whatever he wanted to do. He could follow and fulfill all of its desires and do as much evil as he wanted to do. And Dr. Jekyll wouldn't have to worry about it. He could focus all on the good. So he drank this serum, transformed into Mr. Hyde. And Hyde goes and acts selfishly, acts unkind. And what they wrote, Dr. <coughs> Jekyll said, felt free. So free. As Mr. Hyde, I could just do whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it. And the beauty of it, this is why he was called Hyde, was that when I transformed back into Dr. Jekyll, there were no consequences because nobody could find Mr. Hyde. He was hidden. This is amazing. So he begins to do this. And he takes the serum whenever he wants to act out. And Mr. Hyde does his thing. And Dr. Jekyll focuses on his stuff. But over time, Mr. Hyde grew a little more and more evil, a little stronger. And then one night in his sleep, Dr. Jekyll turns into Mr. Hyde without drinking the serum. He wakes up. He goes, this isn't good. I'm scared straight. He's like, I'm never going to drink that serum again. I am done with Mr. Hyde. Not going to do that. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't throw the serum away. He just locks it up. So, of course, times go by. And one day, in a moment of weakness, he looks over and sees that locked chest. And he decides to unlock it and drink one of the serums. Turns into Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde, after being locked up for so long, he goes on a great rampage and he commits a murder. Now, this is enough to really scare Dr. Jekyll straight. 
So after this murder is committed, he turns back in to hide. He's like, okay, I'm done. So he takes the serum and he destroys it. And he's like, I got to make up for all the bad I've ever done. So he begins to give to charity. He begins to volunteer. He begins to do all of these things, just trying to be as kind and as good and as righteous as he can. And over time, he begins to re realize that he is so, such a good guy. He is so righteous. He has made up for all those wrongs. He is free and clear. This is great. And then one winter day, said he was sitting on a bench. And he was watching the comings and goings. And he began to reflect on his life and all the good he's done. And this is what he writes. <clears throat> He says, after all, I reflected, I was just like my neighbors. I smiled, comparing myself with other men, comparing my active goodwill with the cruelty of their neglect. And at that very moment, the moment of that vainglorious thought, a qualm came over me, a horrid nausea and the most deadly shuddering. These passed away and left me faint. And then, as in its turn, the faintness subsided, I began to be aware of a change in the temper of my thoughts, a greater boldness, a contempt of danger, a solution of the bonds of obligation. I looked down, and my clothes hung formlessly on my shrunken limbs, and the hand that lay on my knee was corded and hairy. I was once more Edward Hyde. He turned into Hyde there in the park. And without that serum, after all that time, he was Hyde. And this time... Edward Hyde did not go away. He transformed and he came whenever he wanted. And before long, Dr. Jekyll was no more. And at the end of the book, Hyde dies by his own hands. Now this story is a horror story because of its truth. When we choose to willfully sin, we think at first it's freedom. We're giving in. We're presenting our bodies to sin. And over time, as sin laughs at us, it begins to take, take, and take, and when we finally realize what we're into, it's too late. We are slaves. Listen to some of these examples from Scripture, okay? Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. So think about that. It says, You get angry, but don't sin. But whatever you do, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't abide in that anger and continue in it and revel in it. Why? Because when we do that, giving the devil an opportunity. You see that? Look at this, listen to this in Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So here's this one. What does bitterness do to us? It roots and then grows. And then when it springs up, it not only defiles us, it defiles many around us. You see how that slavery works? Listen to this one in 1 Timothy. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So the greed, if you're only concerned about getting rich, what happens to that? It becomes a snare that entangles us, and then what does it lead us to? Ruin and destruction. You see the pattern. Sins aren't just sins. Sins become snares. Sins become roots in our lives. Sins give the devil an opportunity when we abide and continue in them, these willful sins. Make no mistake, Satan wants an opportunity in our lives. Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He doesn't say God's enemy. He says your enemy, your adversary, wants to gobble you up. And he's looking for Christians. He's writing to Christians. He's looking for Christians to eat up that aren't being sober and alert that are presenting themselves to sin. Sin wants to reign over you. Don't let it. If you present yourself to sin again and again, you will become a slave. You're like Frodo playing with the ring. You're like Dr. Jekyll playing with that serum. You're like a Florida guy driving through the snow thinking he's got it all under control. You see, we got to think differently about sin. If you haven't heard anything else, remember this this morning. We often describe sin as breaking God's rules. Breaking God's law. And that is accurate. Sin is breaking God's law. But when we think that that's all sin is, here's how it works in our mind. I broke God's law. There's a penalty for breaking God's law. But Jesus Christ took that penalty, so now I can be forgiven for breaking God's law. I'm forgiven. This is awesome. But now what happens after we're saved is, well, if I break a few more rules, it's not as big of a deal because I can just be forgiven. Now, we may be forgiven, 
But sin is bigger and deeper than just breaking a rule. Sin is a disease. When sin entered into the world, it infected human nature. It marred the image of God, and it results in sin. It brought sin into the world. Sin is chronic, and it's deadly. It's not just a rule-breaking thing. It's a disease, and it brought the curse into the world, and it breeds more sin. It kills everything it touches, and we've all been infected with it. When God says he hates sin, he's not just saying that he hates when we do this or that. He's saying that he hates this thing that marred his creation, that separates his creation from him, and that kills those he loves. Yet he still loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to this world to take on that disease for us, to become sin for us, his holy nature becoming sin, our sin. He did that. And he paid the penalty and the price. He offered up his life to sin, and sin killed him. The one who owed no debt to sin died so that we could live. If sin was that dangerous, and it took that much to save us from it, as a Christian, once we are saved and restored to God, and saved from the penalty of our sins, but also saved from the power of sin, what fools are we if we go right back into that throne room and say, shackle me again, willingly, as if we just need some more forgiveness and it's all good. What we are really doing is going back into that disease-ridden sin's tent and saying, infect me again. Salvation is much more than forgiveness. It's a full restoration from sin. We are saved from its penalty today. We will be saved from its presence one day. Today we are being saved from its power. We've been raised with Christ. We are free to say no. We are restored to the Father and we are redeemed from this slavery. Not just forgiven, but healed. Healed from. But too often, we diminish it. You know where sin, slavery of sin starts with? Because it is a lie. Okay, it starts with a couple things. First off, when we become a slave to sin, we convince ourselves of a few things. First thing we do is justify ourselves. Right? And we tell ourselves, well, I had to do it. Well, I didn't have a choice. Well, it's their fault. Well, this happened and I just reacted. We begin to diminish our choice and make it about something else. If we continue in it, over time we begin to diminish sin and we start calling it something else. We say, well, everybody does it. Well, no one thinks that's wrong. Well, that thing is no big deal. Well, and so it goes. We diminish it. We don't like to call it sin anymore. And then before long, we just ignore it and we become hardened to it. So, if you're sitting there this morning, and in your mind, you're telling yourself some of these things, right? If you're saying, sin's not that dangerous. Like, sure, I get how being addicted to, you know, alcohol, that can kill you. But my sin, it's not that dangerous. My sin's not that bad. While some sin is terrible, mine's not a big deal. If you're telling yourself, well i got to take care of this, but one more time. One more time. If you're telling yourself, well, I understand this is bad, but I really, I'm powerless to stop it. Okay. If you're telling yourself that I know they think this is wrong, but everyone else doesn't think this is wrong. If you're telling yourself that God understands what I'm going through, he gets it. If you're thinking any of those things, you need to know that your heart is already hard, and your mind is already closed, and you're already, already, under the power of sin. And sin has already convinced you that you're okay and that it's not raining. Yet you are acting as if you're a puppet and he's got the strings. My brothers, sisters in Christ, don't let sin reign. Don't let sin lie to you. I've seen too many Christians die. I've seen too many Christians defeated. Too many Christians enslaved. Too many Christians joyless and lifeless peaceless, too many Christians loveless, too many Christians completely powerless. This morning, you can be free. You still may have some ignorant sins to work through. You still may have some momentary sins you'll fall into, but you can be free from the reign of sin. The slavery to this voluntary, willful, habitual sin, you can be free from. 
Time constrains me to go through everything. But listen to these four things. Number one, recognize the threat that sin still holds for the Christian. You are saved from the penalty, but there are still consequences to our sins. There is still danger. There is still pain involved for you and those around you. Recognize that danger. I hope you at least realize that this morning. Number two, remember grace. It says, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You see, sin keeps its hold on Christians by convincing them that they're hopeless, that they've gone too far, that they've done too much, that there's no more hope for them. But sin's mastery is built on a lie, for you are not under the law. You are under grace. That means that today you still stand in grace. You are not beyond God's love. He still favors you, and you are still promised eternal life. You have not gone too far. You have not done too much. Grace remains, and it's greater than all our sin. God is one prayer away this morning. James 5.8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Spoken to Christian sinners, he says God will draw near to you if you draw near to him. He's waiting for you. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Whatever you've done, you are not condemned. Christ was condemned for you. So don't let sin lie to you and tell you that you're now condemned. If you let your sin keep you from God as a Christian, that's your choice, not God's choice. Number three. Now, you remember grace, you understand the threat, you got to acknowledge and call sin, sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just forgiven, but cleaned, <coughs> cleaned, purified. We read, dark is the same stain that I cannot hide. God's forgiveness washes us clean. I still remember my sister's wedding, everyone was dancing, you know, enjoying the joy of this, this wedding, okay? Uh, you know, we're celebrating this young couple getting married, Trent and Courtney. And I remember this one girl, she wouldn't go out on the dance floor. She was a new Christian. And my aunt looked at her and said, why won't you go dance? And she goes, I'm not like you people. She's like, what do you mean? She's like, I'm not clean. I can't go out there and dance like you guys. I've done too much. She couldn't live the joy of a Christian life. She couldn't celebrate a beautiful Christian couple getting married and celebrating God's grace and God's love and their love for each other because of something she did in the past. You know, God didn't tell her that. Her sin told her that. And it was a lie. Acknowledge your sin. Be forgiven. Be cleansed from it. And finally, look what Paul says. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And your members are instruments of righteousness to him. Don't spiritualize that. Just pray it. When you wake up in the morning, you know what I do? I say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to present myself to sin to be master over me. I want you to be master over me. So today, the best I know how, in your grace, I present myself to you. This is repeated in Romans 12.1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So pray through this verse. Pray through Romans 12.1. Pray through Romans 6.13. Say, Lord Jesus, the best I know how I give myself to you this morning. I don't want to be ruled by sin. I want to be ruled by you. Pray through it. You don't need some 12-step process. Say that from the heart. And you'll find, you'll find some amazing things. You'll find that Jesus will reign. It may be a little painful to get out of slavery if you're entangled already. But Jesus will win. He will reign. He is faithful and we are not. All men can be liars, but God will not lie. He will reign. You can live free. You can have joy. You can have peace. You can understand God's love and you can spread it to your neighbors. You can live for the glory of God no matter what you've done, no matter what you're into this morning. You can be free. If you want to be. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your grace. Your great <coughs> grace that covers all. That washes all clean. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice that you paid the debt for every sin that you died and tasted death for every man, that you are the propitiation for the sins of the entire world. 
Thank you for being our advocate who daily lives to make intercession for us before the throne. Thank you that we have these exceedingly great and precious promises that we can always go before your throne of grace to receive mercy and help in our time of need. And Lord Jesus, we need help. Sin surrounds us here. We are drawn away and enticed so much. But we know that you are a high priest that can sympathize with us because you were tempted just like us. And though we fall, you do not. And I know you can help us. Help us. Lord, if there are people in here this morning that don't want help, change their heart. For those that do, Lord, graciously reign and lead us and guide us in the way we should go. For our good and your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Can you stand with me? Let's sing another song this morning before we go. Christ is risen. <clears throat>